I'm going to use the opportunity to thank the organizers for having this well organized conference. Uh, Valerie and Greg and Sophie, no thank you. So, ethics, um, as I understand it, is the inquiry into what we have reason to do. Normative ethicists aim at finding broad and general answers to this question and apply them to specific cases. When I speak about reasons for action here, I have in mind normative or justificatory reasons for action. When I'm asked for a reason for my action, I may tell you what motivated me to perform the action. In that case, I give you my motivating reason. I may have performed uh, some action out of anger or frustration, for example. I may have wanted to hurt someone at that point. But in ethics, we are primarily interested in our normative reasons for action. We want to know not primarily what motivates us to act as we do, but what justifies doing one thing rather than another. Are there any objective standards of justification? Objectivists believe that there are. They hold that the reasons for actions are grounded in value. One such value is welfare. Welfareists about reasons for action hold that welfare and only welfare grounds reasons for action. For example, rational egoists hold that only the promotion of one's own welfare gives one reasons for action. Welfareists, egalitarians, prioritarians, or sufficientarians hold that only welfare considerations grant reasons for action and they also have specific ideas about how welfare should be distributed among welfare subjects. For example, they hold that we have reason to make sure that they are all equal in welfare, or that they all have enough welfare, or they hold that we ought to promote the welfare, especially of those who have least of it. Utilitarianism is perhaps the best known welfare theory. It holds in its simplest classical act utilitarian version that one always has most reason to do whatever impartially maximizes welfare. Impartiality here refers to the fact that the welfare of all concerned individuals is taken equally into account. One's own welfare and that of one's friends do not count for more than that of others. In contrast to rational egoists, utilitarians are thus rational impartialists. Welfareists about reasons for action may also hold that when the promotion of one's own welfare conflicts with the impartial promotion of welfare, one may in some cases have most reason to promote one's own welfare, and in other cases have most reason to impartially promote welfare, depending on what is at stake. In yet other cases, one may have sufficient reason to do either what is best for oneself or what is impartially best. If welfare grants reasons for action in any of these ways, then plans are directly considerable only if they are subjects of welfare. Being a subject of welfare is a necessary requirement for direct considerability, or what is usually called moral status. For most welfare theories, being a subject of welfare is also a sufficient criterion for being granted moral status. According to these theories, all subjects of welfare have moral status simply in virtue of being subjects of welfare. <coughs> egoism is an exception here, since even if plants were subjects of welfare, the egoist would take only her own welfare into account. So plants would still not matter directly, at least provided that the egoist herself is not a plant. A welfare subject, to be sure, is an entity that has a certain level of welfare. It can be positive and or negative and or neutral in welfare. Are plants subjects of welfare? In this talk, I argue that plants are not welfare subjects. Unlike other arguments for this claim, mine does not presuppose the truth of any particular substantive theory of welfare. First, I point out that accounts of welfare aim at identifying the basic prudential good or goods. Second, I defend the view called welfare invariabilism, which says that the true account of welfare is true for all welfare subjects. 
Third, I argue that the goods that are available to plants cannot be basic goods for all welfare subjects. Therefore, the one true account of welfare, whatever it is, implies that plants are not welfare subjects. I hasten to add that even though plants do not matter directly, what we do to plants still matters a lot, <coughs> in as far as indirectly it affects the welfare of welfare subjects. Before I will start with the main part of my argumentation, let me first point out what plants are and what they are capable of. One might think that this is pretty clear, but in light of recent <coughs> suggestions that plants can do such things as communicate, be altruistic, feel and learn, I better pause to explain in what way, if at all, they can do these things. And perhaps that's not necessary for this audience, but I do it nevertheless. <laughs> Being asked what a plant uh, is, a child would probably point to trees, flowers, grasses, ferns, and mosses as common examples of plants. A plant, according to the Encyclopedia of Life, is any one of the vast number of organisms within the biological kingdom of planta. The encyclopedia further explains that these species are considered of limited motility, which means that they lack the ability to move spontaneously and actively, consuming energy in the process. It is not to be confused with mobility, which refers to the ability of an, ob of an object to be moved. Plants generally make their own food. They are characterized by multicellularity, cell structure with walls containing cellulose, and they are capable of photosynthesis. But when I teach animal ethics and point out as a relevant characteristic of pigs, chicken, cows, and fish that they are capable of feeling pain, there tend to be at least some students who remark that plants can also feel pain. My kids were told at school that they shouldn't tear leaves of the plants in the schoolyard because this hurts the plants. And one of the best-selling authors in Germany these days is a former rancher who tells his readers, among other, among other things, about the secret lives of trees. And this author takes all inverted comma ascriptions of feelings, desires, and intentions to plants literally and within as many readers. I find this boring. Plants have no nervous system, and there is no indication that anything besides the nervous system can lead to conscious experiences such as pain. Furthermore, pain is the evolutionary function of enabling organisms to avoid tissue damage and the like. Since plants are unable to move away from the threat, pain would not be useful. It would be used as torture. Plants can communicate with each other and do so in interesting ways. They release and receive chemicals via the air and via their roots, and perhaps they communicate in other ways as well. Since if we hear communication, we tend to think about our communication, be it written, verbal, or visual communication, we may be inclined to think that communication between plants also happens intentionally. But communication is simply the act of transferring information from one place to another. Nonverbal communication among humans, for instance body language, gestures, or even our scent, often happens unconsciously and unintentionally. Machines can communicate with each other. Auto racing engineers use machine to machine communication to monitor a car's performance. For example, a car's microchip can tell the engine how to operate under various conditions so that the car can achieve the best fuel economy. Neither the microchip nor the engine is conscious though, and both lack intentions. Also different bodily organs can communicate with each other. According, according to the Merriam-Webster's dictionary, a communication is simply an instance of transmitting, <clears throat> as in the communication of disease. It is important to be aware of what exactly communication of plants involves. The same holds for other alleged plant capacities, <coughs> such as associative learning, altruism, and memory. 
can plants act altruistically? Plants have amazing mechanisms to protect themselves from damage, at least to some extent. For example, when insects feed upon them, some plants emit chemicals that attract wasps, which in turn feed on the insects. Or the leaves that are fed upon release chemicals that signal to other leaves of the same plant to boost production of anti-feeding chemicals. Other plants in the neighborhood also receive these signals. This has been interpreted as plants warning each other, or even as plants being altruistic. If altruism is to be understood as unselfish concern for the welfare of others, this behavior is not altruistic, because it is not unselfish, and it is not motivated by concern for the welfare of others. The behavior happens unconsciously, similar to how our, our skin increases melanin production when exposed to sunlight. So while plants can do amazing things, they cannot act at all. They are not agents in the sense that philosophers as well as behavioral and social scientists use that term. In contrast to automatic or re reflexive behavior or activity, an action is defined as intentional, purposive, conscious and subjectively meaningful activity. Since plants are not conscious, they cannot have any intentions, purposes, desires or preferences and nothing is subjectively meaningful for them. We can of course ascribe purposes and preferences to plants as we can ascribe them to bodily organs, to bacteria or to toasters. But we need to be careful when using these ascriptions since people may misunderstand them. With that in mind, I do not consider it very helpful that the highly respected German Max Planck Institute titled some publication about its own research on plant communication, The Silent Scream of the Lima Beam. <laughs> the entities of which lay people know that they are screaming when attacked are usually thereby expressing fear or pain. If lay people are told that beans scream as well when attacked by beetles, what are they likely to think? Upon closer reading, they would learn that the bean's call for help consists in the emission of nectar. That nectar attracts ants, which in turn drive away the, the attacking beetles. Researchers are prone to over-dramatize their findings in order to attract public interest and thus funding for future research. In the article about the screaming beans, a Max Planck researcher was asked what he thinks about the term plant neurobiology, which had spread through all the newspapers. He answers, quote, it was good that they chose this term. It fulfilled its purpose of gaining attention. Mm -hmm. The process to which plant neurobiology refers, according to the re researcher, involves nothing more than picking up a signal, processing the signal, and responding to the signal. Mind that this is something a toaster can do, so in that sense one could talk about toaster neurobiology. <laughs> this is not to belittle the capacities of plants or of toasters, but public perception of scientific research is highly influenced by catchy labels and headlines that spread through the media and that can give people false ideas about what is going on. So to recap, in spite of persistent claims to the contrary, there is an overwhelming scientific consensus that plants cannot act and have neither feelings, nor desires, nor intentions. So now I come to accounts of welfare. <coughs> an account of welfare tells us roughly what makes an individual's life go well or poorly for this individual. The focus is on basic as opposed to merely derivative prudential goods. Prudential goods are goods for the entity. An example of a derivative good is money. Money is not good in itself, but it is good merely because of the various things that it brings us. Derivative goods derive their goodness from their relationship to basic goods. Being happy may be such a basic good. 
While I talked here as if the goods were things, such as happiness, it is more commonly held that, more precisely, goods are always states of affairs, such as the state of affairs that some individual has experiences happiness. The counts of welfare aim at identifying the basic prudential goods and not to forget the basic prudential bads. Monistic accounts of welfare posit, posit uh, only one good and one bad, while pluralistic accounts assume that there are several goods and or several bads. So if we knew what the correct account of welfare was, we knew the list of goods and bads, and thus it would be easy to see whether plants are subjects of welfare. If they could realize these goods or bads in this world, they would be subjects of welfare in this world, and otherwise they would not be. There is, however, no agreement at all in ethics about what the correct account of welfare is. Is there a way of finding out whether plants are subjects of welfare without knowing what exactly the final prudential goods and bads are? Yes, I think there is such a way. My argument that plants are not welfare subjects depends on the truth of welfare invariabilism. As I use the term here, it refers to the view that the true account of welfare, whatever it is, is true for all welfare subjects. In other words, welfare is basically the same thing for all welfare subjects, even though they may of course need different things to attain welfare. The list of basic goods, according to welfare invariabilism, is the same for all welfare subjects. Welfare variabilism, in contrast, is the view that different lists of basic goods and bads apply to different welfare subjects. Note that welfare invariabilism and variabilism are themselves not substantive accounts of welfare. They do not tell us what welfare consists in. My defense of the claim that the same list of basic goods applies to all welfare subjects draws on Eden Lin's arguments in his paper, Welfare in Variabilism. It's unpublished, but it's available on his website. Lin presents two arguments in favor of invariabilism. The first argument for welfare invariabilism refers to the greater simplicity of this one-size-fits-all approach to welfare. There's reason to favor a simpler theory above a more complicated one, all else being equal. Lin's second <coughs> argument in favor of invariabilism is that it is hard to see what could explain the truth of variabilism. So at first sight, as some considerations seem to favor variabilism, but Lin argues that upon closer inspection, they don't. I will discuss these considerations in the next minutes. The first consideration that seems to favor variabilism appeals to the fact that some goods are inaccessible to some entities. Consider pleasure, which may well be a basic prudential good for people. Since pleasure is unavailable to plants, it seems that if something is to be basically good for plants, it cannot be pleasure. Therefore, it seems that we need different accounts of welfare, that is, different lists of basic prudential goods for different welfare subjects. But that is not the case. After all, if pleasure is a basic prudential good, nothing precludes it from being a basic prudential good for plants. That some kind of thing, such as pleasure, or the state of affairs that some subject experiences pleasure, that something is good for some subject S, just means that if S were experiencing instances of pleasure, this would benefit S. That pleasure is a good just means that if plants or whoever else were experiencing pleasure, this would benefit them. 
but as it, as it happens, plants don't experience pleasure. That pleasure is inaccessible to plants doesn't preclude it from being a good for them. Since a list of goods that included pleasure, or any other good for that matter, would be applicable to plants, there is no need for devising a separate list of goods for plants. More generally, the inaccessibility of some goods to some entities does not lend support to welfare variables. The second consideration that seems to count in favor of variabilism appeals <coughs> to the different natures or capacities of different individuals. One could argue that, for example, theoretical contemplation is good for humans because it is our nature to be rational creatures. As things are, theoretical contemplation is unavailable to crocodiles, but if theoretical contemplation were indeed a basic good for rational beings, then if crocodiles were to engage in theoretical contemplation, this would benefit them. After all, they would then be rational beings. So again, there is no need to devise different lists of goods for different beings. Furthermore, those who think that an individual's nature determines what is good for him or her typically accept a nature fulfillment theory of welfare. The ultimate good, according to the theory, is nature fulfillment. This is then viewed as the sole basic potential good for all subjects of welfare. So again, welfare invariabilism can be upheld. So welfare invariabilism is the simpler theory and there seems to be no need for moving beyond it. Therefore, Lynn argues, we should accept welfare invariabilism. And I agree. In light of these considerations, I will assume the truth of welfare invariabilism. But how does this help us? We saw that the items on some list of goods can be goods for plants, even if they are inaccessible to plants in this world. That they are goods for plants just means if plants were to have these goods, they would benefit from it. This, however, does not entail that plants are welfare subjects in this world. Plants are welfare subjects in this world if and only if some of the relevant goods or beds are accessible to plants in this world. The question therefore still remains whether plants are welfare subjects in the actual world. So that something can be good for you in principle does not mean that you are a welfare subject. <coughs> it seems that some goods and beds are available to plants in the actual world. Plants can live or die, they can be healthy or ill, and they can flourish or fail to do so. The word unflourishing is sometimes used for the opposite of flourishing. Given the truth of invariabilism, the question that needs to be answered now is whether at least one of the goods that are available to plants, such as life, health, and flourishing, is a basic prudential good for all welfare subjects. Since normal adult humans are certainly welfare subjects, we can start by asking whether at least one of these goods is a basic prudential good for humans. Humans can certainly be healthy and alive, or rather unhealthy and dead in the actual world, yet none of these things is a basic prudential good or bad for us in this world. Neither is flourishing, or so I will argue. Since none of the goods available to plants is a basic prudential good for normal adult humans, and given that these humans are certainly welfare subjects, it follows from welfare invariabilism that plants are not welfare subjects. So let us first think about health. Plants can certainly be healthy in a way. Gardeners aim at growing healthy plants and they talk about criteria for determining whether any particular plant is healthy or sick. 
Indeed, plant pathology is the scientific study of plant disease, including the reasons why plants get sick and how to control or manage healthy plants. Disease in this context is defined as suboptimal <coughs> plant growth brought about by a continuous irritant such as a pathogen, that's an organism capable of causing disease, or by chronic exposure to less than ideal growing conditions. For humans, being ill means not exactly the same thing. Human health is not primarily a question of ideal growth. Some definitions of human health are very broad and include items that make this concept of health inapplicable to plants. An example is the World Health Organization's definition of health as a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Another example is the definition of health in terms of personal satisfaction. A definition of health in terms of the absence of disease would be more charitable for our purpose because it is applicable to both humans and plants. The question that needs to be addressed then is whether being diseased is a basic bad for humans. I think that being diseased is bad if it is because of, of what it leads to. When we are diseased, we may feel bad in various ways. The illness may furthermore deprive us of certain pleasant or worthwhile experiences, and it may impede us from doing what we want or what would be good for us. If being diseased had none of these adverse effects, it would be hard to see why it would be bad for us. Being diseased, therefore, is not bad in itself. It is not a basic bad. It is only bad if it is because of what it leads to. It is merely derivatively bad. The same, I think, holds for life. It is good or bad if it is because of what it brings us. A permanently comatose individual is alive However, her life, under these conditions, does not seem to have any prudential value for her. It may be good or bad for others that this individual is still alive, but being alive is not in itself good or bad for her. I think that this example makes clear that whatever makes our lives good or bad for us are things that happen within our lives and not being alive as such. Life, I conclude, is is a derivative or instrumental good or bad for humans. It is good or bad for what it allows or leads to and not in itself. What about flourishing then? Both plants and normal adult humans seem to be able to flourish in a way. And flourishing certainly sounds like something that is good in itself. But what is flourishing? Often flourishing is used as a synonym <coughs> for welfare. Thus understood, the notion is not helpful for our purpose. After all, we want to know what constitutes welfare. We do not simply need another word for welfare. Some authors refer to flourishing as a particular prudential good, perhaps the only good on the list of goods. This is the notion of flourishing that interests us here. We need a better understanding of this alleged good before we can determine whether it is a basic good for both plants and humans. Richard Kraut is perhaps the most influential contemporary proponent of a substantive theory of welfare according to which welfare consists in flourishing. What is more, Kraut explicitly considers flourishing to be the prudential good for all welfare subjects. Welfare subjects, according to Kraut, are living organisms such as plants, non-human animals, and humans. Kraut explains, I quote, if, as we have agreed, it is always good for a living thing to flourish, that is because the things in which flourishing consists are good for that living thing. What then are the things in which flourishing consists? This is what we need to know 
in order to judge whether these things qualify as basic goods for both plants and humans. <coughs> for most living things, Kirk points out, to flourish is simply to be healthy. Unquote. This understanding of what flourishing consists in brings us back to the question whether health is a basic good. After all, if flourishing is good because of what it consists in, and if it consists in health, then flourishing is a basic good just if health is. Health for a human implies more than health for a plant, crowd argues. Says, in our case, flourishing consists not only in the healthy functioning of our bodies, but in psychological health as well. This entails that for both humans and plants, bodily health is considered a final good. Against this claim, I already argue that bodily health is merely derivatively or instrumentally good for humans. Thus, the search of a common basic good for both plants and humans leaves us with empty hands. The claim that flourishing is such a common good comes down to the claim that life or health is such a good and this claim, as I argued, should be rejected. Since life and health, and thus flourishing, are not basic prudential goods for humans, they are not on the one true list of goods, whatever it is. Therefore, the fact that these items are available to plants does not make plants welfare subjects. Since I cannot think of any other items, that may be basic prudential goods for both plants and people in this world. And since people clearly are welfare subjects in this world, plants are not. Therefore, plants do not matter directly. So in this paper, I argue that plants are not welfare subjects. The argument can be summarized as follows. Premise one, an entity is a welfare subject in this world if it can realize basic goods or bads in this world. That's my definition of a welfare subject. Premise two, normal adult humans are welfare subjects in this world. That's my assumption. I think it's pretty uncontroversial. Premise three, the same list of one or more basic goods or bads applies to all welfare subjects. That's my uh, defense based on Lynn of welfare invariabilism. Premise four, there is no possible list of basic goods and bads that applies to both plants and normal adult humans in this world. That was my argument concerning health, life, and flourishing. And the conclusion is that plants are not welfare subjects in this world. Given that welfare, uh, given welfare is about reasons for action, and given that plants are not welfare subjects, we have reason to treat plants in certain ways only in as far as our treatment of them affects the welfare of welfare subjects. We never have reason to care for our plants at the overall expense of the welfare of people or animals that are welfare subjects. But we often have reason to care for plants in virtue of their positive effects on the welfare of welfare subjects. The welfare of people depends on plants in many ways. We need them for food, clean air, water, fuel, clothing, and shelter. Many medications and things that we use in daily life are made from plants. <coughs> in addition, the presence of plants has a significant positive impact on our mental health and well-being. Many people highly appreciate plants in relation to recreational and spiritual activities, perhaps also scientific activities. Also, non-human animals, many of which are certainly welfare subjects, depend on plants in some of these ways. The presence of plants makes life not only possible, but also in many ways more wonderful for us. Welfarists about reasons for action need to take all relevant effects on present and future human and non-human welfare subjects into account when considering what we have reason to do and not to do with regard to plants. So, um, what else uh, can give us reasons for action if not our own welfare or the welfare of others? I think that this is a crucial question that ethicists need to address. 
The rights can be based on welfare, they can serve the protection of welfare, that makes sense. And why is it good that something is wild or natural? Perhaps it benefits the individual that it is wild or natural. Perhaps it benefits others that there is wildness and naturalness around. Otherwise, why would it be good if it were not good for anyone? Why would variety or diversity be good if it was not good for anyone? Why would relationships as such give us reasons for action? We just happen to be in certain relationships. Some relationships benefit us, some don't. Due to relationships, we might be in a special position to harm or benefit some others. I think we don't have a duty towards the universe to make sure that there is naturalness, wildness, diversity, or even a maximum amount of welfare in it. It is rather the case that if certain individuals exist or will exist, we have reason to make them better off rather than worse off. This is a conditional reason. It is conditional upon the existence of the individuals in question. I think we need to make up our minds about what grounds reasons for action, be clear about it, and go to the bottom of it. I think that this, this is something that we haven't sufficiently done yet, both analysis and environmental analysis. If we do that, we may reach agreement on this level, and even if we won't, we may still reach agreement on the level of practical implications. As I said, even welfareists have reason to care about plants. So, that's it. Thanks for your attention. So um, I have a comment and then perhaps an objection. The first comment I'll, I'll be really quick is uh, at the beginning when you uh, say that uh, some people claim that plants are altruistic and that they should not say this because plants are not consciously uh, uh, ha do not have a conscious concern for the good of others. It seems to me that many people who say that plants are altruistic may be using the evolutionary sense of altruism, which does not involve it. So you may. Uh, at least want to add a footnote in your paper to uh, specify this aspect. Um, yeah, my main point was you have to be clear what you mean by okay. altruism or whatever. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and then my objection, I'd like to challenge your uh, second, um, uh, the way you responded to the second pro-variabilism uh, uh, argument. It, it seems to me that your response um, relies on uh, the assumption that saying that there are different goods for entities that have different natures entails that therefore uh, their good is just are just instances of uh, a more general good which is nature fulfillment and it doesn't seem to be the case to me because the fact for instance the fact that uh, it depends on the nature of sentient, sentient animals that pleasure is part of their good does not entail that uh, pleasure is good for them in virtue of being the fulfillment of their nature. It seems that uh, those are two different claims and uh, uh, so I'm not sure to see how uh, the argument follows. Okay, then I would be interested in hearing more about that. Okay. Um, because if you say that it is good for them because of their nature, uh, it depends no. on their nature, but that doesn't mean that it, it is good in virtue of their it's, nature. It's a contingent fact of the world that sentient beings are the way they are, and the, the, uh, an effect of this contingent fact is that pleasure is good for them, but the causal relation does not entail an in virtue of relation, which would be uh, the idea that uh, pleasure is good for them in virtue of being the fulfillment of their nature. Those are two different relations. Okay, um, then, then for instance, but still, if, if um, then still pleasure could be good for plants because if they were experiencing pleasure, it would be good for them and they would be 
they would yeah, end up to nature, then <laughs> otherwise they wouldn't experiencing it. Yeah, I was not objecting to your yeah. first. Okay, uh, uh, to your sec to my second. Uh, yeah, I was just about this. Okay, uh, I would be interested in hearing more about that, or perhaps you know examples of people who defend these views. So um, <coughs> you, you pointed out uh, at the beginning of your talk that there's no agreement about exactly what welfare consists in. But then your, um, your argument against plants having welfare was to consider particular proposals for what their welfare consists in, and then arguing that, well, those, are, those seem to be just instrumental. But it seems to me that the, the existence of disagreement about what welfare consists in, even for humans, suggests that you can play the same game with any particular property that you, any, any particular way that you try to define welfare. And so um, what you would end up with is a contradiction with your second uh, assumption, which is that humans have welfare. Because basically for any, anything on anybody's list, from a different perspective, you can say, well, that thing only has instrumental value. It doesn't have intrinsic value. Therefore, you end up with the conclusion that actually nothing has welfare in, in the world. And, and that's a contradiction, because you, you assume that uh, humans have, have, have welfare. But I don't know if, you, if that mm -hmm. is cogent. Um, I think one way of disagreeing with me would be uh, claiming that I'm wrong in saying that uh, health and life are only instrumentally good for people. That's, uh, I'm fine with that, you can agree with me about that. Um, I think uh, no one, really, I mean, I think no one to whom I'm talking would want to argue that normal adult humans are not welfare subjects. I think that is broadly agreed. Even, I mean, if you disagree about the truth of hedonism, preferentialism, objectivist theories, or whatever. I mean, or if, if the implication of your disagreement with me is um, being committed to the claim that normal adult humans are not welfare subjects, then I'm <laughs> happy to grant you your view. Uh, I think then that is so counterintuitive that it won't be attractive. I guess I was just arguing that if you apply a similar line of reasoning to the candidate theories of welfare, you might end up with... I don't think so, because um, I don't think um, that other potential goods... I don't think that all potential goods for people are merely derivative goods. I think, I mean, people, everyone would agree, I don't say what, what the basic good is, but I think nearly everyone would agree that there is some basic good for people. Uh, that's, that's what welfare is all about. So welfare is about identifying what is basically good for people. And <clears throat> if you agree that people are welfare subjects, then you have to agree that something is basically good for people. And perhaps uh, some um, possibilities are more plausible than others. But as I said, one can disagree with me about that. You can say, no, well, you're wrong. Uh, health is basically good for us. That's a possible position. Um, thank you for the talk. I, I thought I was very, um, was very well informed about the state of the art where uh, the science of uh, plants is concerned. Uh, what struck me though was <clears throat> the declarative nature of your uh, discourse. Um, and that reflects uh, a, a lack of scientific humility. Um, animals used to be automata. And have not. Um, mountains used to be the result of uh, uplift, now it's plate tectonics. Um, uh, uh, group selection was uh, an absolute anathema in biology, now it's back. Um, can, can, can we not say that that as far as we know, the current state of science suggests that, and so on, rather than these, these declarative statements that plants are not conscious, that plants do not have intentions, that they do not act, uh, and so on. Mm -hmm. Just qualifying that to some extent in, in the spirit of scientific epistemology. Yes, I think that's a matter of style. I, I could have expressed myself differently and said, as far as we know, 
scientific consensus at our times, then that might change. That's that's true. Um, sorry, I forgot your name again. Uh, Lewis. Uh, I have like one uh, remark and one question. Uh, the remark to it's, uh, the, the question that was made about like what if we end up saying like no one is, is well for subject. What I understood from you talk is that you said like if we like there is no definition of welfare that can be both applied to humans and to to plants basically. And like we don't like what I found interesting is that you don't say welfare is something in itself, we say, if, if we call welfare what's good for humans, there is no way we can use the same, like, it's a contradiction to use the same way to say what is good for plants, basically. So, like, we don't, and uh, uh, what I understood is that you don't put uh, an intrinsic value in welfare, you say, welfare, like, if we define welfare what, pe what people enjoy, basically, then, uh, like, plants can happen. And my question is, like, did you think about the like, political implication of saying one of your uh, sentences, which is very strong, when you say, like, we have to say something is good, not in itself, but because it, it's, it, like, it's good for someone or for something, because I think we can really see in, in political discourse and like, political discourse that people want to say this is good for itself. Like, it's good to be moral, like, just to say can, for example, it's good to be moral because it's good to be moral and that's it. Rather than saying, because I, I see kind of like, hedonistic in which so like what is good is what please someone and uh, and the second question is like how do you wait uh, between two like between two things that please someone but like goes against someone else how do you do that mm -hmm. yeah I mean I, I'm committed to the view that uh, only Balfa gives us reasons for action though I think being moral being moral whatever that amounts to, <laughs> and doing something only makes sense we only have reason to do it if it promotes someone's welfare, otherwise, why would we? <laughs> so, um, yeah, um, and there are different welfareist views. I didn't commit myself to any particular welfareist views. I mean, I'm not a rational egoist. I wouldn't say that only my own welfare matters. Uh, I'm not sure whether everyone's welfare matters equally, as utilitarians say, or whether some like dualism of practical reason. It's true, like uh, for instance, it was Henry Sitchwick uh, mentioned that dualism of practical reason, or uh, Walter Crisp affirms it as well. So, uh, or prioritarianism, egalitarianism, all these views. I didn't commit myself to any particular view. I think that's a different discussion. Yeah. yeah. And um, how you weigh the welfare, yeah, that's partly the answer to that question. It depends on your precise welfare theory, and also uh, on your notion of welfare. Uh, some, some notions of welfare imply that, uh, let's say, um, well of humans are better off than well of pigs. For instance, uh, objective list accounts of welfare say that we, more, more goods are available to us, so, and other accounts of welfare don't have that implication. If you, for instance, uh, have a, a nature fulfillment account or self fulfillment account of welfare that does not have this implication. But, yeah. Okay. Well, actually, that kind of picks up on what I was going to ask. So I felt like I was kind of channeling Paul Taylor while I was listening to your talk. So I wondered whether, why you didn't talk about an account of um, welfare or well being that was about sort of fulfilling your, your basic nature, a kind of Aristotelian. Or Taylor type camps. It seems that that could work for plants and animals and humans. Um, and so then we would have, I mean, obviously, we might specify differently in detail, but would that not work? Okay, um, okay, that's interesting. Uh, I thought that I kind of covered that by the notion of flourishing. But then we change that into health. Right? Yeah, that's exactly so, what someone like to okay. so that's another way of disagreeing with me. That would be like saying, um, you know, you, you were not charitable enough about flourishing, about, for instance, crowds view, or maybe there are other no, accounts of flourishing. You're not charitable enough about flourishing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, yeah, then, then I just need an alternative view. What, 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 do you need, what do you mean by flourishing? And whatever it is, is it a basic good for us as well? Yeah? If, if it doesn't apply to both plants and humans, and and, or is it just another word for welfare, right? 
if it is so broad that then it, it's nothing more than another word for welfare, then it's not helpful, and it's not a substantive theory of welfare. Uh, so, yeah. But that's an interesting, um, an interesting thing. Yeah. But Kraut is supposed to be an Aristotelian. Uh, huh? Okay. Right. So he, he, his his account is the most prominent Aristotelian account of welfare. So I would perhaps need to look at different accounts or, as well. Yeah. Great, thank you. So, so this is um, a little bit of a follow-up to a question about scientific humility, um, as well as, in a way, to your talk this morning. Um, so one question is whether plants are welfare subjects, and I think the answer to that question is very likely no. Another question is whether we should treat plants as welfare subjects under conditions of uncertainty about the answer to that question. And my credence is not one that plants are not welfare sub subjects. My credence is maybe 0.9 something. <laughs> um, so I wonder if there might be a risk and uncertainty based argument for treating plants as welfare subjects <coughs> if you're not absolutely certain that they're not. In general, we think this will come up a little bit um, tomorrow in, in my own talk, although not related to plants. But Generally, we think that in cases of risk or uncertainty, we should either err on the side of caution or do some kind of expected value calculation. It might turn out that we should treat plants as having at least partial welfare um, if, if we're not absolutely certain that they don't. Uh, I wonder, now, I, I feel torn about that. I, I want to resist that implication of my own view about this. Um, but I'm not sure that I ought to. It might be that I'm committed to thinking for that reason that we should treat plants as welfare subjects, or at least partly <coughs> treat plants as welfare subjects, and, and, unless and until we're certain they're not, which we may never be because of the problem with our minds. Um, I just wonder what you think about that way of framing the question and that way of um, erring on the side of partial consideration for plants because of epistemic humility, even if we privately think at the end of the day they're very I haven't thought about that, so I don't believe. Um, but I think it's difficult if, if really nothing speaks in favor of it, nothing you know, counts in favor of it. I, what, what gives me reason to doubt, you know, in case of plants, there are no indications whatsoever that they are sentient or so I think I could as well doubt that whether plant, whether stones or chairs, you know, there, there, there need to be some limits. So um, yeah. What, what can you know for 100%, you know? That's so, what I want to yeah. say, too. I yeah. just have a hard time knowing where to draw the line in a principled way between, say, erring on the side of caution for insects, but not for plants, for example, or, yeah. you know. Yeah, I, yeah. It's, I think it's difficult. I think if we, if we don't have any indication whatsoever, it's hard, you yeah. know. So you said that uh, X is good only if it's good for someone, mm -hmm. that, and, and then that's tied with the idea that being good in that sense, good for welfare, is the only reason for acting. And mm -hmm. so, so what's wrong with the idea that uh, one, we might intrinsically value something? So we value it for its own sake. Mm -hmm. And that gives us a reason to protect it or something. Mm -hmm. What's wrong with that idea? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's not good for anybody. Mm -hmm. <coughs> if I value something for its own sake, and it's not, maybe I need, need to leave the own sake out. If I value something intrinsically, mm -hmm. it's not benefiting anybody. It's not even welfare, but it's still a good that we might want to act to protect. Yes. I can make room for that view in two ways. One way is um, that you are not an objectivist about reasons for action. So you do not think that value crowds reasons for action, but you think that our pro-attitudes crowd reasons for action. That would be a meta-ethical subjectivism. Yeah. Um, of course, that was another way of disagreeing with me. I, I think I assumed, I, I don't know, that many uh, animal ethicists or environmental ethicists are meta-ethical objectivists, but I, I'm not sure about that. So if you think that it is not 
uh, objective value that God's reasons for action, but our own poor attitudes. Um, yeah, then I already left you <laughs> in the very first sentence of my talk, more or less. Uh, but that's fine. I mean, that's, that's a huge discussion. Uh, another place where I could uh, make room for that is um, it, it kind of benefits me that there is variety and biodiversity because it just makes me happy to know that this exists. So then I could like bring it back to my own welfare or to the welfare of those who happen to value that. Um, yeah, this would be two ways. <laughs> Sorry, it's, I don't know your name, Larry. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. Um, I'm, I agree with the conclusions, but I have some concern about the argument. And if I have a good understanding, I think you claim that uh, human, um, there are some goods who are accessible to human that, that are not accessible to plants. But it seems that even if we accept the admirability, we can flip the argument and suppose that plants uh, have some goods who are accessible to them and not to humans. So I don't know if you are thinking about this possibility. Uh, no, I don't. Uh, I don't. Um, so um, I think that there are goods. Um, so I think first I argue that um, the fact that some good is not accessible to a plant <coughs> in this world doesn't mean that it is not good for a plant. That might sound strange, but the idea is that being a good for some entity just means that if the entity were to experience it, were to realize it, this would benefit the entity. That's enough for being a good. <laughs> so it doesn't, that something is good for a plant um, is not depending on whether plants can actually realize this good in this world. So, um, and this allowed me to say that um, we do not need different lists for different entities just because of inaccessibility. So that was part of my defense of welfare invariabilism. Yeah, I understand that we can, we can flip it and think that maybe plants uh, have some goods that we are okay. not uh, accessible to them, but who can be put in the list because it can be good for us if we were able to to experience them. That's just, we can put the argument in the other Yes, that's fine. Um, uh, but given welfare invariabilism, these goods, I mean, given that, we, and given that we are welfare subjects, right, there must be some, since we are welfare subjects, there must be some goods that we can realize in this world, and that also plants can realize in this world. There must be some common goods. Uh, unless you think that your credence in the fact that plants are welfare subjects is higher than your credence in the claim that humans are welfare subjects in this world. But I think that's not the case. So, um, yeah, there could be good for, goods for plants that are not available to humans, theoretically. Um, but given the fact that we are welfare subjects, and given invariabilism, there must be some overlapping. <laughs> That was my argument, but maybe you can find ways of challenging my defense of uh, invariableness. <laughs> Antoine, did you have a quick point? Uh, well, if some other people want to speak. Okay, I come, there's a few more people on the list, but I'll come back to you. We might very well have time. Uh, so, Josh? I oh, passed, sorry. Yeah? Oh, we have time. I was just going to say, I, I, think, I think you made a very good point, and I think you may have missed slightly okay. what was being suggested, so I, I want to try and. You say there has to be some overlapping goods, and you already say that, for example, the experience of pleasure is an overlapping good. If plants could experience pleasure, they would be good for me. So we have an overlapping good. Um, and we can experience pleasure and get a good, and exactly the same thing might happen in reverse. Plants experience X, or plants get good X, yeah. and were we to get good X, uh, we would also, our welfare would increase. This yeah. seems conceptually plausible. Um, but I'm with you. <laughs> not, I still yeah. agree with you. But I think um, the point is, um, there are two different questions. One is um, the goods. But in order to be a, a welfare subject in this world, the good must be available to you in this world. So in order to be a welfare subject, uh, you, you, your welfare must be able to go up and down. That's my definition of welfare subject. 
So, um, from the punch bowl, I can go up and down based on X. I can't go up and down based on pleasure. I was going to go up and down based on pleasure, but can't go up and down based on X. So it, it's exactly parallel. Yes, um, but there must be a same good. If you, if you agree with welfare invariabilism, the same basic good must make their and our welfare go up and down in this world, right? Okay, yeah. well, well, couldn't I say there are two basic goods in the world, pleasure and X? And for every welfare being, every welfare experiencing being, pleasure increases welfare and X increases welfare. And it just so happens that pleasure is accessible to all sentient beings, X is accessible to all plants, but there's no crossover. Um, and then I have a basic account of welfare according to which there are two primary bases of welfare, pleasure and X. And then I have an account whereby plants have access to welfare. And I have an invariant. Now, this account doesn't work because we don't know what X is. But it's at least conceptually plausible. And that's what I understood your, your okay. point. Okay, it's interesting. Yeah, I, I haven't thought about so it. So until we find an X, it's, it's yeah. a bad account. Yeah. Yeah, it's at least plausible. But it's interesting. It's logically, it's, it sounds, I have to think about it more, but yeah, it might be logically plausible. It's her idea, not mine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, thanks. So I think it's just a it's kind of a follow-up to Ned's point in some way. But so I think I'm completely on board with the general view, and I think the argument you give is a good one. But I think there's two conclusions that you try to draw. One is that plants aren't welfare subjects, which I'm on board with. But there's a second. I mean, so I'm not sure how much you. So in part, this is clarificatory. Where are you arguing then that we're somehow committed to the kind of welfareism? Because that seems like a different argument, which you don't give an argument for in this paper. Um, so and you could be. I don't mean you need to be a subjectivist about the good to think that the good could give reasons that do not relate to welfare subjects, right? So I just, I mean, in a way, to clarify whether you think that somehow the stronger conclusion or the more general conclusion holds from the argument or if it's just something that you're sympathetic to that mm -hmm. welfare. <coughs> I can't argue for it here. That's true. Um, my main argument was that plants are not welfare subjects and the other thing is just a kind of context. If you yeah. are welfareist, then it has this that was conditional, yeah. and I didn't defend welfareism, not really today. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I wondered what you would say to someone who said, uh, if a plant could experience pleasure, it wouldn't be a plant. Mm -hmm. So sort of trying to block the counterfactual kind of move that mm. you used to defend welfareism. Okay. Um, yeah, I think uh, Lynn discusses this in his <laughs> paper on welfare and variabilism. Um, yeah, so that um, would be a count. That would be a defense of welfare variabilism, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, perhaps you would need to say, yeah, it's not a plant, but whatever it is, it is a welfare subject. Plant is good for it. But yeah, I, I need to look in this into that more. Yeah, 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 yeah. So Duncan and then Antoine. Yeah. Alberta had the exact same point. Oh yeah? Okay. Okay, well then I can yeah. So I read the Lynn paper and I can't remember what he said, but I thought he said something like that counterfactual should be true if we appeal to impossible worlds or something like that. Like there might be an impossible world where the plant experiences pleasure and it's good for it. Uh, and that's why it would be good for the plant for it to it's something it, it's weird. But um, I can't remember that. So, well, but you anyway, might say, yeah, whatever it is, whether or not you call it. Whatever it is, it is yeah. Um, but I wonder, can you say a little bit more about accessibility? And what, so is it, I, you might have explained very clearly what it is. Can you say that again? Mm -hmm. So what is um, it for yeah. to be accessible to a Yeah, it is, um, um, you can realize it in this world. For instance, like pleasure is not accessible to plants in this world because the pleasure cannot go up and down, the welfare cannot go up and down in virtue of realizing pleasure. Yeah. So can so what about someone in like a persistent vegetative state? So what <coughs> is pleasure accessible to them in this world, in your view? Um if it's so persistent, yeah, and then I would say it's not a welfare subject anymore. And the only and yeah, so that's that sounds a little weird to me because it sounds like you want to say that there's something regrettable about the person's situation. Sure. But we and wouldn't say that about non-welfare subjects. Uh, sure, but uh, uh, if you are painlessly killed, 
uh, your lifetime welfare is lower than it would otherwise have been. And if someone ends up in a coma instead of having more pleasant or whatever, <laughs> well, of years, that's regrettable because uh, his or her lifetime welfare is lower than it would otherwise have been. Um, I think the situation as such is not intrinsically bad, just like death is not intrinsically bad, but it's bad because of what it deprives you of. And that's why coma is bad as well. No explanation doesn't doesn't it not apply to non-sentient uh, Right, because um, they, are, they don't have any lifetime welfare to be deprived of in the first place. But if they were not non-sentient, they would have a higher lifetime welfare? Um, if, if there are individuals that, if there are welfare subjects, <laughs> that means perhaps probably living sentient individuals, I don't know, uh, then um, the fact that they are killed, for instance, usually, usually, uh, um, might be bad for them. It's bad for them if it deprives them of further welfare. It's good for them if it deprives them of suffering or negative welfare. Yeah. Um, I have like just one remark regarding the, the coma thing, and like thinking about it, you can still like we we should evaluate. Helping someone come out only with regards to, like you said, the welfare that they could have from like what happened before, and also the welfare they could have like in the future, basically. But, like the person who right now cannot experience anything doesn't really count as like some like doesn't have any interest in itself. Like either the, we should care take care of the body basically only because if someday this person wakes up, then she prefer like having two legs and not having any legs, basically. But not for like the body in itself and. Um, uh, what was the other thing? Oh, yeah, I can't remember, sorry. Any other questions? Yeah, Antonio. Yep, Patricia, you're in. If you have time, I might add up some uh, push to the counterfactual issue. If we replace plants by ecosystem, if ecosystems were to experience pleasure, uh, it would be good for them. And I think that using ecosystem instead of plant may, makes it even clearer that the counterfactual is somewhat problematic. I have no idea how to settle the question whether uh, there could actually be ecosystems with our, which are still ecosystems and uh, can experience pleasure. You know, I don't, as long as I don't claim that ecosystems are welfare subjects in this world, I mean, it's just, it's just kind of um, definition of what it means to be a good for some entity, I mean, it's 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 surprising, perhaps, yeah, that a pleasure can be good for chairs, can be a good for chairs, but that doesn't entail that a chair is a welfare subject in this world. But it just it, it, it just in, it implies that if a chair were to experience pleasure, that would benefit the chair. And I agree. I mean, if a chair, I mean, assuming that pleasure is a basic good, if a chair where to experience pleasure, that would benefit the chair. That's but all that, I say. But doesn't it presuppose that there are possible worlds where chairs can experience pleasure? That's an assumption. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, perhaps there are. I don't know. I don't know whether this is uh, a requirement. Okay. Oh, oh now we have more questions. <laughs> is it okay? Uh, yeah, quickly. Quite, yeah. Yeah, you. That's okay. Um, thank you for the presentation. And I'm just curious if you have examples of plants being granted welfare. Because I'm, I'm, because you were done the earlier presentation made the connection about um, like justice and rights and whatnot. And I'm thinking in Ontario, for example, um, you can't pick the trillium flower, so they're technically like it's a it's a form of protection of life, right? So um, is this is. <laughs> I think that um, protection of plants makes sense even if plants are not welfare subjects uh, because we, we, our welfare depends on plants and even if it's only that we like to have them around or, um, I think there are philosophers who argue that plants are welfare subjects such as uh, Richard Kraft for instance. And are there any examples that you know of that like in some place there's actually welfare being applied to plant life? or plant, whatever we call it? Uh, legally or something? I don't know. I don't know whether there are such things. 
I mean, <coughs> I've heard about granting legal status to a river. I don't know. I think the examples might occur, but I'm not aware of any particular example where plants are granted personhood or whatever. Uh, I don't know, legally. No? Just to follow up on that, um, I, I don't either. I know of cases of legal rights for ecosystems and legal rights for animals. But the uh, document that inspired the legal rights for ecosystems was, was called Should Trees Have Standing? And the author argued in the affirmative that trees should have legal standing and legal rights. So the idea is out there. I don't know if it's been. <coughs> even, that might even be compatible with my view if, if it promotes our welfare to yeah. grant legal rights to trees. That's fine. Do you have one final comment? Uh, yeah, like uh, I just find them, uh, like remember my question. How do, do you have any any uh, ideas on the, uh, like handling uh, subjective welfare and like general welfare in a way? So like with an individual that would have an idea of what is good for them, how do you determine like if how do, like if you override the subjective evaluation? Like let's say someone is sick. And like doesn't want to receive the treatment, but you're like, no, like I know this will give you five years longer of life. And uh, do you have like I did like should you override what they feel like is good for them because you know that they'll live longer if you do what they don't want you to do to them. Uh, I think there are two questions. Um, one is um, about the core theory of welfare, and there is this distinction between subjectivist and objectivist theories of welfare. It's a very unclear distinction, but some people think that um, perhaps it subject, a theory of welfare is subjectivist if it entails that the subject knows best about what is good for her. Um, I tend not to agree with subjectivist theories of welfare in that respect. Um, so even, but even if you accept an objectivist theory of welfare and hold that people can um, Air, or they can be, you know, received about what is good for them. Then it's still a different question whether you have reason to paternalistically enforce your ideas from them. I think that's that's a different issue. Uh, I'm also not uh, princip in principle against all forms of paternalism or anything like that. But I think that's that's a different issue. It, it's it's it doesn't follow from your objectivist account of welfare that paternalistic action is always justified. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so I think it's time for lunch. Thank you, Tatiana. Yeah.